up next on the SRI 360 podcast. You're managing the world's largest microfinance fund with $2.4 billion on the management. We only do investments which have positive social or environmental impacts and at the same time generate market rate returns. Microfinance is providing access to financial services to people who have been excluded of the financial system. Impact investing can really change things at a scale which you would have previously not thought that it would be possible. The SRI 360 Podcast, presenting world-class investors and experts, passionate about improving the world and making high-performance returns through unique ESG, impact, and socially responsible investments. Here's your host, Scott Arnell. Hey, everybody. Today, I'm visiting with Philip Mueller, and Philip is the chief executive officer of Blue Orchard, the well-known pioneer and leading global microfinance impact investment manager that connects millions of entrepreneurs in emerging and frontier markets with investors. He came to Blue Orchard in 2018 from Partners Group. Philip holds an MBA from the ETH in Zurich and a master's degree in law from the University of Zurich. And now, please meet Philip Mueller. So this is really happening, huh? <laughs> it was a bit of a challenge to find the suitable time, but obviously great. Congrats to your book, Coming to Shape. I know that must be quite an effort just from our book that we published last year. So, <laughs> Did you yeah. publish a book last year? I mean, we have for the 20 years anniversary, we published a book which is called This Is My Story, where it just went into the stories and backgrounds of some of the micro entrepreneurs, which we met along the way. And we had some uh, also obviously some insights about microfinance, about also impact investing, and then the end, um, a basic bit of an outlook where the industry is heading. Uh, it's more of a coffee table book in a sense. You have nice pictures also from a very talented photographer and was published by the National Geographic. It was actually quite well received, but it, it is not as text heavy as the previous books that were published on the Blue Orchard. I think also the, they are right to, to make it a bit more accessible to everyone. But it's really also great to really show the, the individuals behind the statistics, I would say. They always say these kind of projects are 3% inspiration and 97% perspiration, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yes. Yeah, it's quite a lot of work. We've got a lot to go through today. And to start out with, I'd like to hear in your words what your current role is and how you describe just at the 30,000 foot view, what is it that you do? And then we'll go from there. So it's obviously Blue Orchard as an independent impact investment manager in the sense that we are a commercial operation but our goal is very much to positive environmental or also social impact in the world and at the same time achieve an attractive financial return so that is the definition of impact investing i'm heading the company as a ceo and managing basically the extended and the senior management and i'm responsible at the end to achieve the high aspirations and goals that we've had set ourselves and, and maintaining our leadership position as one of the pioneering and leading impact investors in the world. And my role here is I see that more as a football coach, right, to make sure that we have the resources, that we have the team, that we really have also the direction, the strategy, and then can follow through and all that with intrinsic motivation to really generate a lasting positive impact. So before we dive into that, maybe you could just fast forward me through a little bit of your background. If I had to guess from your name and your accent and your education, you were born and raised in Switzerland? I was born and raised in Zurich and I've spent some time in the UK for internships and also three years during my work at Paris Group. But from my university background and also where I was born, I was privileged to be born in, in Switzerland. I guess your undergraduate education was University of Zurich? So, yeah, University of Zurich, and which is basically a master in law. And then I, after some time, I did an MBA at MTech at ETH Zurich. You did you know, some time in the Swiss Army. So Switzerland has a comp compulsory military service from my family tradition. I then also was encouraged to also follow suit on, on being an officer from my side. I think it was a very great experience in the sense of 
I mean, I was a mountaineer. I was uh, in the mountain infantry. So I was so basically privileged to do military service where others are now staying in, on vacations or working in Crans Montana. <laughs> no, but, uh, but, and obviously that, that is, is for me was a great experience. Also great in terms of getting to know a lot of people with all different backgrounds. As you know, in Switzerland, the military service is compulsory. You, you have all sorts of backgrounds, people also from the different regions in Switzerland. So that was a great experience, but it's also a long time ago. And then I think yeah. it's also the connection of this being compulsory. For me, there was a worthwhile experience also showing me as well a different world that not a lot of people are allowed to see, right? And from that perspective, that was an interesting experience. Then you spent quite a bit of time at Partners Group, I think, right? Yes. So first I did my internships, one at Man Investments. I also worked during my studies at 3.3, right? But then after finishing my degree, I joined Partners Group as a financial analyst. List that was in an associate program. I rotated through the different teams, and also uh, again, I went to the UK to help build out the UK office. So, when I started, it was about 10 12 people, and in the end, when I left, it was about 90 people there. Yeah. It was a great experience, and also, obviously, as well to experience, I think, one of the most multicultural cities in the world, which is London. I'm just very interested on a personal level. We've all taken one route or the other to get where we're at. Sometimes it's planned, sometimes it's serendipitous. But how did you end up working in finance? A lot of us in Switzerland don't often stop to think about it. You know, the nature of the beast in this country is there's probably an over representation of people working in banking and finance related professions. So I'm interested. Did you always know you wanted to work in finance? Was this an idea you had or did you arrive? into the finance career through an unexpected sequence of events. It's like everyone ends up in his profession, right? This is through a relative or a brother. <laughs> <laughs> so in my case, I did a master in law and I realized very quickly after passing the first exam that I, I'm not cut out for spending my time in front of the commentaries and I didn't want to pursue like a profession as a lawyer. So then I was looking at, at things where I could apply that skill, but obviously with a bit more I would say practical background through my work at 3.3, right, that I did during university, I then found my way into finance. I would say from that perspective, obviously, Switzerland has quite a cluster, right? You have, you have a strong financial service sector, so it's not uncommon. But uh, from my side, this was really also a, 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 a decision that I didn't want to end, didn't want to work as a lawyer. And so then I found my way in, in finance and I started out and an internship at a hedge fund and I quickly discovered that this industry is not for me right it's too intransparent I think it has certain incentives which are wrong and I couldn't relate much more with private equity and private markets which has a very great entrepreneurial aspect to it and also as a creative and I would say the aspect of building up things and improving them and from that perspective and then I really enjoyed working in private markets and I think it's obviously from that perspective it's also the entrepreneurial side that I really enjoyed and also the people there which are talented and, and are typically very also interesting personalities. You spent a number of years at Partners Group and then you moved to Blue Orchard a few years back. It seems to be a bit of a change from the raison d'etre of Partners Group. So I, I guess there was some transition or something drew you towards it to impact. So already a Partners Group, I worked on projects related to sustainable investments and then they really decided to work fully in this field. And then when I was asked to join Blue Orchard, I really saw this as a great chance, right? Blue Orchard is really an epi near an expert in its field. It's a very dynamic, multicultural company, global company with a great mission and aligned also with my values. So I wanted to, in the end, also align my work with my values and on the finance side specifically, right? So at some point it, it felt a bit shallow when I wanted to really, yeah, do something with a bit more purpose behind it. And this is then why I decided to join the orchard. And in the end, I guess from an intrinsic perspective, I'm a father of three children. It's I wonder a lot of the time, what will be the world like that they live in 20, 30, 50 years? And from that perspective, I think it's something where I can actively contribute, right? You can donate something yeah. as a one-off, but if you are an impact investing, you can really change certain things at the scale, which you would have previously not thought that it would be possible. And so that is really what attracted me to this. Why don't we start with an overview of Blue Orchard, what it's doing, what your mission may be at the 10,000 meter level, just to frame everything else that we'll drill down on. Yeah, so Blue Orchard is an impact investment manager. So we're focusing on impact investments. So we only do 
investments which have a positive social or environmental impact and at the same time generate market rate returns. Blorch has been a is now in existence for 20 years. That's been founded by initiative of the UN. There were the Millennium Development Goals. So these were the predecessors to the Sustainable Development Goals. And, and in some of these project groups, there was also one project about microcredits. And out of that spawned Blue Orchard as an independent company. And by now we're managing the world's largest microfinance fund with $2.4 billion on the management. And we are an expert in emerging and frontier markets. So most of our staff is actually located in our regional offices. One is in Lima, Peru. One is in Kenya, Nairobi. And one is in Tbilisi in, in Georgia. And one is in Singapore, and which previously was in Cambodia, but it took longer from the airport to the city center in Cambodia than it took <laughs> from Singapore to anywhere else. Um, and yeah, and Lorch is a diverse and, and multinational company, right? So we have about 110 people working for us and also I mean, from a gender perspective there's around 50 50 and we have more than 40 nationalities and we're also a thought leader in impact investing meaning that we shaped a lot of the concepts a lot of the frameworks a lot of the i would say the things which are now becoming more mainstream along the last 20 years and we are let's say one of the pioneers and are also expanding on basically microfinance or did that from a long time ago. So we are now multi-asset managers. So we manage private equity, more like liquid instruments like impact bonds, green bonds, social bonds, and then also on the infrastructure side, focusing on, I would say, medium-sized sustainable infrastructure projects. What exactly is microfinance? (laughs) What exactly is it? And maybe make it real by giving me a few examples. I've never worked in it. Of course, I've read all the same things everyone else does. So it's for me first, I want to understand exactly what you mean by that. Yeah. So so basically, microfinance is a way to, to really advance financial inclusion. And financial inclusion means that providing access to financial services to people who did not have the chance before. So basically, to so include people who have been excluded of the financial system, who have a low income or lack sufficient funds for entrepreneurial activities, and they want to get a loan, a saving, insurance, or do payment services. And microfinance is one of the one of the tools to really make financial services accessible to a population which has not been in position to do so. And I think it's unthinkable if you come from a more developed market background where we are fully overbanked, but there's a lot of markets where people have no paper trail, no passport, no things to show for, and they are not eligible to get a loan. They're not eligible to get any anything to start a business. And microfinance is actually closing exactly this gap where people who are entrepreneurs, they're in a position to get the first loan to to buy produce and sell it somewhere on the market, to, to buy tools, to buy seeds, to buy things, and then really work themselves out of poverty at their own terms. And it's also not, it's not a donation. It's not basically a gift, mm-hmm. right? It's really an eye-to-eye transaction where people are then taken seriously <laughs> in that sense, really from a, for the first time where they can enter into business transaction and then they get a loan, which then enables them to start their business or to do other things. I mean, it's not extending only to entrepreneurs. It's also people who need access to capital, which they did not have before. So microfinance is allowing for this. I think it's one of the key tools to advance financial inclusion and alleviate people out of poverty. So as the name implies, we're talking about very small ticket financings. Is that Correct, right? Yes, depends a bit on the different markets and where you're at, right? Uh-huh. It's from, from that perspective, you have certain markets where the average loan size is really small, and there's other markets where uh, I guess the markets have evolved, have grown. The micro entrepreneurs are now small and medium businesses, and they are needing a business loan, and in the end, are allowing people to have formal jobs and formal employment. And so depending really on which market, you have different stages. Also, you have different type of institutions. Some are focusing really on the very remote areas and the rural areas, and others are focused more on, on urban 
in cities and you, there you have this crap on average loan size. But typically, yeah. loan size is relatively small. Can you give me some example or range of the type of ticket size we're talking about yeah. the, on the base of the pyramid end user? Yeah, you have from, I don't know, two to three hundred dollars to to three thousand, right? Or to fifteen thousand mm-hmm. case of SME, right? It really depends on the market and also on the currency and on, on what exactly yeah. this is for. So from that perspective, there's also a big variation in investment partners that we work with the local markets, right? Of, of their focus, what their priorities are, but generally microfinance is really, these are really micro loans per definition. So you're talking large numbers. I think you said you have 2.4 billion under management. It's easy to lose the human connection. How you get investors' money from the investors' hands into the base of the pyramid borrower? Yeah. Because I imagine so, so, you're not making these loans directly from your office, right? To the end user. Correct. Correct. That would not be efficient. And it would also require us to have, instead of 110 employees, to have 400,000, right? It's not a, <laughs> it would be a very relatively large scale operation, which I also think would not be the right allocation of resources. So what we do, we are selecting and working together with trusted partner institutions in emerging and frontier markets. We have a team which is really managing the relationships there, in sourcing the relationships and maintaining them with these institutions. And there is part of that team which is really analyzing these institutions and making sure that how they are making these loans, that this is sound, that these loans are being explained. So from an impact perspective, we have a very thorough impact management and process, which is done and designed by a separate team, our Planet Finance Impact Management Team. And we are looking really at social aspects. We are looking at governance aspects. We're looking at many aspects of of how uh, these institutions operate. Then we also look at, obviously, at the actual numbers, right? We are performing something which is I would say related to what a Standard Poor's or Moody's would do, if they would assess a financial institution, right? So we do a, do a credit rating and also a financial strength rating of that institution to really make sure, okay, is it set up sound and so on. So you also do a commercial assessment of that. And lastly, we do a risk assessment on the country risk, on the regulatory risk, on also KYC risk, who owns that microfinance institution, who is involved in there and make also sure that from that perspective, institutions are sound. And if you are convinced that this institution is fit for our, uh, for example, for this main fund, then we would give that institution a, a loan or, I mean, there's different types of instruments you can work with, and then that institution would pass this on to its end borrowers. So we are selecting trusted partners in our network, which are then basically are doing the micro loans from our perspective what you do we really a thorough due diligence so really go to the branch which is the furthest away from the headquarter basically to really assess how these institutions operate and uh, so so that is for us uh, at the core of what we are doing right and mm-hmm. it's also that we are monitoring what's happening there so we are monitoring from portfolio development so we have relatively stringent reporting and we are also monitoring it from a social standpoint because we cannot, as an impact investor, we cannot withdraw our money immediately, right? That would have dire consequences for the people who are at the end of that chain. But obviously mm-hmm. what we can do, that we can influence how these institutions operate and then hint at them. We can also make them aware of certain shortcomings and work with them and then improve their operations. And so having done that for 20 years, we have a great network in, in, in different countries and we are also very selective on who we work together with. Is there normally one institutional intermediary between you and the end user, or are there layers? No, there's normally one. So I guess if what you're getting at is basically, are there many people in the interim who are holding up their hand? But that's really also what we are. I mean, we give directly to one intermediary, and then that intermediary would then make the loans and to really make sure that actually in the end, from the rates perspective, right, there is not too much lost in the interim but on the other hand we have found that this is the most effective way to really cover that and make yeah. sure that that the loans find their ways in the most effective manner to the end borrowers the devil's always in the details i understand everything you're saying yeah. but you are working in emerging and frontier markets and i've spent a good part of my career working in these places too and a lot of these places are places where the rule of law let's say isn't always the rule. Where there's money involved, there's often corruption, and sometimes there's corruption on an industrial scale. Is that an issue or is that not an issue? Or 
where it's something you have to watch carefully? No, we have, we have a dedicated team, right? Our risk team is very much involved. So when we do an investment, we have our investment team, which works together with the impact team to really do the assessment of that institution from an impact, I would say, from an analysis perspective. Then we have a portfolio management team, which really looks at basically the diversification, looks at the structure of a transaction and so on. And then we have a large risk team, which does nothing else than assessing what you mentioned, right? Regulatory risks, legal risks, compliance risk, making sure that there's no red flags of people involved there in these institutions and all that. And I would say... It, it really then boils down to selecting the right institutions. I mean, many of these have been NGOs working in, on microloans have been grown into large institutions and sometimes are not fully fledged banks. There is a lot of corruption in some countries. It's not all as, as bad as it sometimes is described. And I would say there are certain cases, but you also can filter out. But we like to not have too much. I would say the institutions that work together with are not linked to to avoid that they're linked to government because there I would say there's there's a heightened risk to, to, uh, to for corruption. But I would say from the more private institutions founded by enthusiasts and now that have been grown over the last 20 years, there, there's also different uh, sub-segments. But obviously we are not naive. That's why also we have our local experts that can really assess the quality of an institution and assess the background. Did I understand you correctly that you try to avoid institutions that are linked with the government? Did I understand yes. that? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Your mission, of course, is admirable, and there's nobody who's going to argue with you on that. Your reach is great. But impact investing is all about, in the end, having an impact. Would you be able to give me a couple of real-world examples of microfinance impact and the results that you've obtained? And in this case, I'm really thinking specifically about examples of impact on the life or the livelihood of an end bottom of the pyramid borrower i can recommend you our book <laughs> <laughs> which will give you a great insight into this no so, but uh, apart from that we have a number of people and and i guess the ones which are the easiest to tell is the ones that you see yourself right so so basically i was in pura which is north of lima is in peru in the north up there and that's a relatively i would say it's a location where you have a lot of development needs and obviously it is i would say in some areas are really poor in pure and there you have a great institution which is modeled after the german sparkassen right you have one of these casas it even has the logo from one of the german sparkassen and one of the founders i met there and he did a trip to germany and he learned how these sparkassen are doing it and helping people to save helping people to to do that and he was really proud he showed me his operation which is really well organized all how he selects the talents from junior people who work there who are basically there educated of he showed me the training center how people are being educated at the loan offices and so on and then we went to the market the local markets with, together with some loan offices which really knew everyone they were there in these markets at interesting interaction with some of the the people there uh, on these market stands trying to sell their goods and then we also interact with them and ask them okay what is their interaction with that with that savings bank there it's also interesting to see that basically this is competitive right they could get a loan from the savings bank and then he really went to one of the micro entrepreneurs and he showed me he, he, he produces leather works right and he mm -hmm. got his first micro loan i think it was 200 dollars or so to buy his tools he's a great craftsman basically he did then over time grow his business now his wife has a shop in one of the more touristy centers and he can feed his family he can send his kids to the school there and this is just showing basically what what an impact you can have by providing such entrepreneurs access to capital so already basically he repaid his loan relatively quickly then had another one they could build out a shop and so on so really helping people there to build an existence and uh, there's very similar uh, across the board we have so many of these backgrounds of people in cambodia who who then started to uh, collect garbage and then do, uh, have a recycling center there and sell that re recycled materials on and just a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of creativity in emerging frontier markets of people who, if given the chance, really are taking it and, and build their existence on this. They just need an initial push. From that perspective, 
I really think that providing such people as individuals access, but then obviously doing it at a large scale really does make an impact. What are the benefits to microfinance investors? <laughs> and I don't know if you can say what your targeted returns are or what you benchmark against, but are there advantages apart from helping people maybe in lesser circumstances and giving them a leg up? What are the financial advantages to investors? So, so you have a very resilient and very stable asset cost. Microfinance will not provide investors with double-digit returns, or at least not in the current environment, but it will obviously give them a very stable and steady return. And it's also because it's much less correlated to any other asset classes or financial, historically less correlated to other asset classes or markets, right? So because microfinance typically, a lot of people who are in rural areas who are serving the needs of local communities, and basically they're not connected into the sense that their activity is not connected to whatever happens on Wall Street or on or mm. in other financial centers. So you have an activity which is less correlated with other economic activity, that means also the asset class is very resilient, right? You have people who, in many of the markets you're in, they need to go to the market to buy their food. They need to go to the market to sell their food. Is they're working agriculture and so on. So this is a very resilient, what's a business serving local communities. And so from that, as an investor, you have I would say, single digit returns. Obviously, it really depends on the different portfolios, how they're structured, what they're targeting, and so on. So we have some portfolios that we have together with development finance institutions, which are really targeting tier three. So they're really small microfinance institutions for, for a certain impact outcome. We have a woman empowerment fund for the ASEAN region, which targets female entrepreneurs and so on. So, so it really depends a bit on the portfolio you're building. But all in all, I think the the returns are market rate, right? So that is attractive for investors and really also less correlated to, to other asset classes. When you say market rate, is there a benchmark that you target? Or? Depends really on, on the funds and the mandate. I'm not sure I'm yeah. allowed to tell that uh, for co- okay. compliance reasons. You can look it up on the on, on our website, but it okay. really depends on the fund and mandate where, where these uh, returns are. Who are your typical investors and why are they investing with you? What is the main attraction? So there is obviously a very broad range of investors, right? So you have even so have what we can see there's a, there's a generational shift of wealth owners, right? There's a younger generation which cares more really about what is happening with their money, how their money is being invested and what is being achieved. So that we can see. So there's a really bottom up demand for impact investing products. But there is also I would say some very institutional investors who who invest because of, as I said before, because it's less correlated. It's just uh, adding to their portfolio and making it more efficient. I think there is also, I would say, investors which are generally interested in it, but they say, look, in the end, I'm also happy with the return it brings me. You know, the impact aspects are fine. So there's a really broad range. And obviously, you have banks, intermediaries, insurances, pension funds, family offices, high net worth individuals. So we have a really broad range. I think you were acquired some time ago by Schroeder's. And does that in any way provide any retail investor access to your activities? Or? No. So we partnered up with Schroeder's. So, so we are majority owned by Schroeder's, but also we have a minority, which is with the management, just to flag that. I would say the the... the there on, on that side, right? So we, from a microfinance perspective, that is not typically a retail offering that is for regulatory purposes, but we have seen a lot of interest for impact investment, uh, obviously, uh, offerings. And there we have signed a fund, which is a USITS fund, which is basically yeah. picking up where our microfinance funds investment universe is ending. So basically the NGOs that we accompanied that have been grown, they're now basically fully fledged banks and access with access to capital markets issuing bonds with an impact bond fund. We can invest in this. We can also invest in, in social bonds, in green bonds. And that that impact bond fund is an offering which is for retail investors. And this is the type of offering which I think is attractive for retail investors, also because of its liquidity and other features, right? Not every investment offering is suitable for retail yeah. investors, but from our perspective, we have added to that. And it's also one of our, uh, I would say, aims to really make in, in impact investments accessible to all, right? You want to make it accessible yeah. to the widest possible audience. And that's one of the measures we, how we can add to that. So all this sounds like a win-win wonderland in terms of the benefits to the investor and to the end user. 
But are there downside risks to microfinance investors? I would say, I mean, over the last 20 years, we could demonstrate, right, that this is a highly resilient asset class. Also now during the COVID pandemic, we could demonstrate that this is a highly resilient asset class. So, so obviously you need to be cognizant as with every investment with the risks involved. I think we obviously in emerging and frontier markets, we have, let's say, a higher regulatory and currency and so let's say, all the risks, but we also are really a platform to manage these risks. It's really about also managing the risks that you are dealing with. And from that perspective, I think it's a stable and resilient asset class. I would say as an investor, you, we all, every investor needs to define his or her risk appetite and his or her return expectations. And from that perspective, people who want to have a stable, steady return for them, microfinance is, is suitable. And for others who are looking to, for high octane, their returns, they, they're better suited to the crypto space. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you for a recommendation on that. I think I've read Blue Orchard as a leader in structuring blended finance, and you've kind of alluded to that in one of your previous comments. Can you tell me what blended finance is and how do you use it in microfinance investing and and, and what are the yeah. benefits to private investors of these type of blended finance structures? So blended finance, you could also describe it basically as public-private partnerships with the, for in investment context. And the blended comes from basically having a, a capital structure and, and investor base, which is from a let's say public side. So we have development finance institutions and, and, and multilaterals. And we have also private investors in the sense of all sorts of institutional investors, but not in the public sector. And so you blend basically public sector investors and private sector investors with the money that you, you can attract from or that is, is invested by public sector investors. They want to obviously leverage and multiply the impact that they can achieve with the funds that they are that they're deploying. So main, meaning that for every, I don't know, for every dollar they invest, they want to attract four dollars from the private sector. And typically these mm-hmm. blended finance mandates, they have a specific impact goal, right? They want to have a financial inclusion agenda, climate adaptation agenda, and so on. So these are very specifically designed mandates. And the blended finance helps also to change the risk return profile of such an investment. So there are certain causes, for example, of yeah. climate change adaptation where people will typically not invest, right? They would not invest into an insurance in Africa where which is now rolling out climate insurance products without just, just like this. Or you would have to fi- look really hard for investors. But if you have have basically a change in the risk return, profile of a fund. So for example, if there will be a first loss piece in a portfolio protecting the investors to some extent, then some investors would be prepared to, to make an investment there. And from a development finance perspective, it really helps to attract more capital and to really leverage what they can do to, with the private sector capital. Just to clarify, if I understand everything in a nutshell, blended finance allows DFIs or, or markets to attract private investors who can get a higher return than perhaps the DFI requires, but with less risk than it would be without them. It's not just a higher return. I mean, in this case, you're also basically risking it a bit to some extent, right? Sometimes it's not leverage in a sense that you would put on leverage. It's, it's changing the risk return profile of a specific investment portfolio, right? If you, for example, would say as an institution, a quarter of the portfolio has a first loss protection, and we are careful in selecting these investments on, but as an investor coming into that fund, you know, okay, quarter of the money needs to be lost before I'm hit as an investor. So I would actually be more inclined to invest in a strategy which is helping basically to the climate change adaptation, I would say to the advanced climate change adaptation, so basically increasing the number of climate insurance beneficiaries in ODA countries, or which is basically on, uh, focusing on education finance in Africa. So certain things which regular investors would not do, but if there is a certain enhancement of the risk return profile, they are now willing to do. In the past, the microfinance investment space hasn't been without controversies since the start. Have there been lessons learned and safeguards put in place you know, as a result? Yeah, for sure. The industry now has matured considerably. Lorch is a 20-year track record. There's also others which are close to that. So there's been a lot of lessons. I would say there's continued discourse about over-indebtedness, right? Of certain countries where you're at a relatively high debt, debt to GDP ratio. It's, to some extent, it's also 
a political discourse, right? Because with microfinance and impact investing in general, you're advancing, I would say, the more and more capitalist solution to a lot of the problems, which some people have inherent problems with. But on that side, the industry has come really far. Originally, you have quite a lot of regulation about interest rate caps, about all that. You have local credit bureaus, you have also certain self-regulation, you have industry standards. So from that perspective, I think a lot of the criticism has been addressed to a large extent. And I think, nevertheless, there will always be cases where you have certain institutions which are not obviously following which, which then are clearly not a counterparty for us so it is also to identify the right institution that we partner up with but i would say all in all i think the industry is matured and being regulated over time also you have a central bank control in many countries so i would say a lot of the criticism i think has been addressed and also there's a lot more transparency here in the industry and also generally right so i don't think that that nowadays in that industry, you can afford to be involved in any in transparent practices. And yeah. I think it's from that perspective also really important to have a very strict investment process. And uh, obviously, I would say also for us, with the platform that we have, which is so large, right, there could be a case where this has not been followed, but then we would immediately take action. So it's from that perspective, I think, something which we're really focusing on. I know that greenwashing isn't a term that originates in the microfinance industry, but the concept might apply, you know, that perhaps MFIs or other players, I don't know exactly who, might be trying to appear socially responsible and delivering positive impact from a marketing perspective when in fact in reality they're not is this an issue and how does blue orchard protect it against those kind of practices by the underlying mfis because you're pretty much reliant on them to deploy the capital you're in a lot yeah, of markets. So have, have, how do you ensure consistency across all these markets you know? yeah i mean we have our very strict process right to the 20 year track record of in-house expertise and impact management and measurement we also verify this we also obviously as said before we track this we have a reporting we have reporting about things we can measure like average loan size we have other reportings scorecards so that's obviously really important so our impact management tools we have a regular impact reports that we issue we also ask the, these institutions to report Report on their side. And then I think we are being constantly, I would say, in touch with the development finance institutions that we run dedicated mandates with, right? So our processes are top notch. Also, now for our COVID support fund, now by every three letter acronym, <laughs> development finance institution really looking at our processes and making sure that we can identify and, and look at what the institutions are doing that we are investing in. I would say, from that perspective, I would say greenwashing at MFI level is, is maybe less of an issue than obviously greenwashing on a wider investment product offering that you see out there. And there, I think an important tool can also be verification. So, we, so for example, our microfinance fund has been recently verified externally also, and our and finance mandates obviously there together with leading development finance institutions. So there, we don't have verification externally, but we have a very very tough due diligence processes sometimes with these, together with these development finance institutions. I'd like to get your view on the future for leveraging the technology for impact in the microfinance industry and what you might see as the future. And I'm thinking of an example like M-Pesa in Kenya. They use mobile phones and you know it has transformed money lending, money transfer industry there. Where could that technology go next? Do you have a view on what the opportunities or the future might hold for that? Yeah, there's huge opportunities. I think specifically as many of the markets we are in, they, they do not have the le legacy systems that they need to be basically compatible with, right? Yeah. On their platforms, they can start from scratch and they can basically take a leap and not having <laughs> not having to be involved too much with some legacy solutions and so they can really use the, the, the most recent technologies and i think that the development costs are much lower in many of the countries right and mm -hmm. the knowledge is universal right you can learn programming wherever you are and um, there's exciting new technologies which are out there i think from a microfinance and then the mo and, and i guess uh, financial inclusion perspective there are a lot of advantages of technology because of also reach right you reach people who otherwise you would have to drive to in really remote places because a very large rural part of our portfolios i think that really helps you can reach people which you could otherwise only reach through a branch network or whatever so so you have a, let's say broader reach 
And from that side, there's also exciting technologies which are supporting this. But also in the end, I mean, my client side is still a people's business, right? It's also about literacy. It's about understanding what you're entering into. And from that perspective, trust and the relationship. So that will not go away or hopefully will not go away. But I think from the means and to make it more accessible, I think technology plays an important role. What do you know now about microfinance investing that you wish you would have known in 2018 when you showed up at Blue Orchard? The way we do it, it's a very structured process involving multiple teams, right? From from a risk team to a legal team to a investment team to the impact team to the portfolio management team to credit monitoring to all sorts of things. It's much more complex and to do it right in the markets we are in, it requires a significant platform. So I would have thought it be much simpler asset class to enter into. It's quite a big platform and it's also very, I would say, personnel and resource intense. That's something which I didn't know before. I thought it would be relatively straightforward. There's an NGO, they give out loans, that's it. But there's a whole <laughs> value chain and a lot involved until this happens, which is rightly so because as exactly the address the concerns you, you said before. You don't have to name names, but was there ever a deal that you were convinced of at the time that you invested in and it ticked all your boxes, but in the end it failed? It went pear-shaped, and what did you learn from that experience? You can be right in your investment thesis, but you can be wrong in, <laughs> in the timing. I think that can happen if there's certain political change in certain countries. So that's for sure one of the things that, you, that there is. And the other thing is really to, I guess, from a, for, from a growth perspective, right? You have certain, obviously, institutions which overstate their growth expectations, and that something which we're looking now really close into it. But other than that, I don't think that, that many cases is very pear-shaped. As mentioned before, it goes through a multi-step investment process. And then if something goes wrong, sometimes it's a calculated risk that you would have to enter into. Yeah. Was there ever an investment that actually you were skeptical of and when you went into it, or maybe you passed on and then in the end it really turned out brilliantly and you wish you would have had invested or just turned out against your expectations? And did you learn anything from that? So, so we are multi-asset investors. So right so on the debt side, we are obviously barriers, right? So there's no upside in debt. So <laughs> basically, there's no upside there. But what I really like is on our private equity side, we have a great company that we invest into, which is called Agritask, which is providing smallhold farmers and others, more than 20,000 or like 30,000 now, with basically decision-making support in more effectively managing how, how their farms. And this is an investment which I think, at the beginning, I was very skeptical. I was very skeptical agriculture technology and about adaptation. And now I just see it's really great what they've built and how they can help farmers to also be more effective in the use of resources, in avoiding pesticides sides and so on. So actually, I was very skeptical of that because I thought it's a different, but now I think really it's great. And you also see that, that basically as a farmer, some of them are really high tech, right? They, you, yeah. you, as a farmer today, you need to have a smartphone. If someone wants to get into impact investing in the microfinance space, how would you advise them to get into the business? What would be the best place for them to cut their teeth? Sure. There's an internship at Blue Orchard, which is always an interesting <laughs> opportunity, but no, in all seriousness, I think it helps if you've been an investment professional elsewhere and trained up there. This is obviously helping to really get the grasp of concepts and also to have some sort of, a, of a educational backpack, right? I think that is one area where we're basically entering this as someone who has already been in the financial industry. Other than that, really training it up from the beginning, right? From academia, there's great courses and, and also by now also education that is, that is really focusing on the field and also literature. And then I think there's also field works so of people who, who want to go and work for impact investment managers abroad, right? That this is also a way to do it, right? If you're mobile and want to do that. But I think there, there's many ways to get into that. I think what is most important is really to have the intrinsic motivation and to really have the, I would say, the sense of purpose, right? And then I think there's multiple ways to do that. Listen, I think I've got to the end. I appreciate you taking the time. I've learned a lot. It's been good. And uh, some other time I can find out a bit more about your equity investing activities, but we we'll save that for another day. But it was very nice meeting you. Likewise. No, that's great. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks. It was, it was a pleasure. Thanks for the great interview. And looking forward to being in touch. You've been listening to SRI 360. 
If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to get future episodes. You can find an archive of all previous podcast interviews and more articles and information on SRI, ESG, impact investing, sustainable investing, and socially responsible investing at our website, SRI360.com. If you'd like to read more lessons learned from world-class SRI investors, get a copy of Scott Arnell's book, Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360. It's a must-read for anyone wanting to know more about investing for positive social, environmental, and ethical impact, all with market financial returns. These are the stories and tactics of those leading the way as sustainable and responsible investing goes mainstream. Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook format wherever books are sold.